Hey guys, it's Biggs. Welcome back. Now, uh, today on today's topic, we're going to be talking, we're going to go back into the mind of madness, another episode, and we're going to be today, we're going to be talking about a topic that I get constantly asked about. It's something that, uh, for some reason, everybody that deals with these types of fish eventually will face one aspect of this one way or another, and some people just don't know how to deal with it. So, the topic today we're going to discuss, and that's the key word, discuss, this is not Biggs schooling everybody this is not bigs telling you matter of factly this is basically opening up the doors for discussion because this topic has many factors and many many variables so there's not one answer to everything and uh, the topic today is we're going to discuss aggression in cichlids now as a lot of you may be aware the family cichlidae is a pretty massive family of fish. Now, they're pretty fascinating. You know, there's everything you can imagine from the diminutive little tiny Neolamprologus multifasciatus from Lake Tanganyika, the little tiny shell dweller that, you know, maxes out at just over an inch in size, all the way up to some of the big bruisers like uh, the, the, the Umbraferis from, from Panama and Colombia, or the Nicaraguan and Costa Rican Dovi wolf cichlid big bruisers, all the way, uh, you know, you got your cichla, your peacock bass in Brazil, and then you got your giant monster over in Lake Tanganyika, your Boulangera chromos microlepsis. And all these monster fish and all these diminutive little fish, they all share one thing in common somewhat, and they all have different or varying levels of aggression when kept in an aquarium. I'm not saying they don't have aggression levels outside of the aquarium, but they definitely do show a lot more traits in the aquarium. And my goal today is to kind of give you hints, tips, maybe understand a bit more of the biology or physiology of some of these fishes so you can understand and maybe find adapt ways in your tanks to adapt and deal with the aggression levels a little bit better. Now when we're talking about aggression, we got to break it down into a few factors and stuff like that, okay? Are we talking uh, the aggression, is it due to uh, environmental factors? Those are things we're going to talk about. Are they behavioral factors? Are they perhaps sexual factors? Are they factors that are driven based on them trying to reproduce? Each one of these things is vastly different, and a lot of them are very, very complicated, but with some very, very basic understanding of the physiology and biology of how these fishes work and how these fishes think, maybe we can adapt to them, okay? So let's go right into it. Let's start looking at some of the, the, the big groups or the common groups of some of these fishes uh, as they pertain to the, where they be in wild. Now, a lot of the things we have to understand how these fish inhabit or how they, how they work in the wild for us to get a better understanding of how they work inside our aquariums. So a lot of very, very, uh, let's start right at the basics, the ones that everybody kind of knows dear and near and dear to their heart, uh, the Malawi cichlids. Lake Malawi is a very, very old lake, okay? Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika, the two big main rift lakes, there's also other insular lakes, there's like Lake Victoria and Lake Edward and Lake Fuan. There's all sorts of other lakes that are, kind of there, that are being explored to more and more extent. But the big two that are known to everybody are Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika. Now, I'm not an expert on any specific group of fishes. A lot of people call me and tell me that I'm an expert in this and I'm an expert in that, no. Expert is somebody that's done learning, and I'm going to be learning all the time, and I enjoy it. And that's the thing that keeps me going. But uh, I've never really kept a lot of cichlids from Lake Victoria. I've never uh, kept a lot of the weird new ones that they're finding out of Lake Edward and like all these different weird little lakes and stuff like that. I've never kept a lot of those ones. So I don't really have a lot of opinion specifically about them because I don't have any personal hands-on experience with them. But if we talk about Malawi specifically and Tanganyika as a general, okay? I know there's going to be exceptions to a lot of the rules. You know, uh, the rules are meant to be broken within an aquarium sometimes. Sometimes fish will breed really, really young versus they normally they wouldn't, you know. A lot of other factors. But let's look at the holotypes as they would be in the wild. Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika being both very, very old ancient lakes. Lake Tanganyika is actually far older than Malawi. And that's what gives you an idea because when you actually took a book, if you were to take a book, like some of my old tomes, the original number one of Malawi and the original number one of Tanganyika. And you just look at the diversity of the shapes, the color patterns, the morphology, the structures, the dietary habits, everything the way the fish are built. You can tell that Lake Tanganyika has evolved for a lot longer period of time. There's some pretty diverse species in that lake. Benthochromus trichotai, and I know it's been renamed, whatever, but you all know it as that. Your frontosis, your thithial pharynx, your trophius. You know, there's a lot of diversity in that lake. And then you look at Lake Malawi, 
A lot of the fish are fairly similar. Yes, there's exceptions like your eye biters, your, your uh, dimidiochromis types and stuff like that. And some of your different open water fish, which I honestly, I've, I've never had any experience with a lot of the open water stuff like your, uh, the stuff from Malawi or Tanganyika really. Uh, a lot of very different stuff but in, in Malawi specifically you look at all your Mbuna types your rock types very very similar in body shape structure morphology jaw structure everything musculature very very similar uh, there's not the same diversity in Malawi as there is in Tanganyika okay however when we're talking about the main topic being aggression Malawi cichlids if you are an Mbuna and you live on those vertical rock walls uh, you might have three miles of coastline of rock walls and the rock wall goes below the oxygen level in the lake. So you actually don't have a bottom. You just have a rock wall to live on. And you sit there all day finding your prey source. Now, if you're a, a, a metroclema or a pseudotrophius, you're primarily a, an off-walk scraper. So you're sitting there scraping away at the off-walks all day and you're just moving your way down, the, down that path. You might not have an actual permanent home on that rock wall. You're not apartment 2C over here. You've got that three, three mile long rock wall and the fish move about and it's a fluid living dynamic. But however, if you were a Melanochromus, like an Aratus, a Johanni, some of those ones, they live in kind of what would be called like an intermediate zone where the rock wall starts to dissipate and there's maybe several massive big boulders. They could be boulders the size of a house, but they could be a lot of big boulders and they're just, that is their only spot they have. So they'll very, very aggressively defend that home because if they get kicked out of their home, they're in trouble. Because in Laoi and in Tanganyika, a species that lives on a rock wall cannot really traverse open water, cannot traverse uh, open sandy areas, because other species have evolved in those areas to capitalize on their prey sources, which is primarily going to be fish. So if you're an open water fish, you're not eating algae. If you're uh, open water or living over the sand and stuff like that, you're probably are either a predator or a sifter or something, you know. But each one of those fish is capitalized and evolved to adapt to each one of these different niches. So Melanochromus, like the Aratus we were just talking about, they live and they might have this massive rock and they've got to defend it because that's the only rock they have versus those guys that live on the rock wall, they got all sorts of space. And because these lakes are so old, they're giant chasms in the earth. When you look at them on a map, you can see it. But then if you actually look at species distribution and you look at this side of the lake versus this side of the lake, the lake might be miles and miles long, but this side here and this side here, there's often a species on this side of the lake that looks almost identical to the species on this side of the lake. Because eventually, originally they would have been really, really close together, probably one species. As the, as the chasm got bigger, they got separated. And again, they can't traverse the open water to get back and forth. So this species evolved now independently of this species here. That gives it different things. And over time, the geology of the lake or something might change within the lake and stuff. And maybe rock walls will divide and open a sand chasm. And all of a sudden now that species has now become two species. One here, one here with a, a, an open area in between. And this one will evolve independently and this one will evolve independently. That's just, to me, that's really, really cool and really, really unique. So when setting up an aquarium for Malawi or, or, or Tanganyika cichlids, we have to take in, into consideration several factors. The main ones being primarily diet. Diet would be my first consideration because when you look at Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika, and to a lesser extent, some of the other different ones, each one of these, these areas have different species that have evolved differently to have different dietary habits. So if you're an algae scraper and you're a devote algae scraper, that means your intestinal tract has actually evolved to adapt it to eat algae. And to eat algae and to process that it means you need a long, long, maybe 10 times the length of your body uh, intestinal tract because it's not a very efficient method of gathering food. So it takes a long time for the body to extract those products out. However, if you were a predator and your main diet sources would be meat sources or fish or snails or whatever it may be, you'd have a very short digestive tract because proteins are very, very readily assimilated and easy to digest. Now, where, that, where the problem comes in is fact is if you were to mix not necessarily a predator, but a meat eater like a snail crusher or a, uh, an invert picker or something like that, but something that had a very distinct dietary habit that was protein based and you were to mix that in a tank that would be algae based, it'd be very, very challenging to feed one or the other species. 
trying to make a nice balanced diet that was good. Then you remember back in the day you heard about things like uh, they always talked about Malawi bloat and bacterial infections and all that stuff. Well, you think back in the day, the only real food that they had available when these things were coming out was probably your basic tetramin in the yellow can. Fish food hasn't ev it wasn't evolved at that stage. So now, now it's changed and a lot of these things can easily be corrected. But keeping them in different tanks or, or setting the tank up properly to mimic the habitats of these fish is, is crucial. But more importantly, I think diet is first. So second, as I alluded to already, is gonna be the, the, the actual structure and setup of the tank. If you're dealing with imbunas or, or the rock scrapers, set up the tank with lots and lots and lots of rock. A grand, some of these species may never ever see the bottom. So seeing the bottom of the tank is irrelevant. Fill the tank with rock. Trust me, you do these things and you try to mimic these habitats as best as you can, even though the species you may be bought may have been bought at a local pet store and may be so far removed from wild, they often still have those natural instincts that they would in the wild. And the more shelter that you can provide, the more cavities of varying sizes, so you can keep very incised fish in the tank, will help greatly in reducing the risking of uh, that level of aggression that we were trying to discuss. Now, the other factor is, Anytime you want to add new species to an existing community of fish that are hyper aggressive like Malawi cichlids or sometimes some of the Tanganyikan species, the best way of introduction is to honestly take all the decoration out of the tank, add the new fish, do your water change, do your big maintenance or something at that stage and stuff, and then put everything back in in different spots. What you're going to do is you're going to upset the hierarchy in that tank and that alpha male, that dominant cichlid that's going to be in that aquarium is no longer going to be the boss. He might very well be the boss tomorrow, but he has to reestablish his, his hierarchy and then the, the newcomers basically almost go unknown or unseen as they're added into that community. And that's your best chance of success. Now think about other species and stuff like that. You got your little Julie Chromis, you got your Calvis and your Compressiceps and stuff like that. You got your shell dwellers. You've got your algae scrapers. You've got deep water, open water fish. Each one of these, they, they inhabit certain niches and they've evolved to come and live in those certain niches and stuff like that. Now, if they have a habitat that has very, very low cover or it's, 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 op it's open, it's low cover, there's, you know, whatever. Those are often factors in regards to aggression because they have to defend those things. On the other side of the world, we've got in South America and Central America, you have fish that have done the same thing. They're, they're, they're newer fish, they're newer world fish, uh, and they've done the same thing. They've evolved to capitalize on these different areas for their feeding behaviors and breeding structures and whatnot. So you have many different facets. You have open water cruise predators. You've got invertebrate sifters and diggers, sand substrate sifters. You've got, uh, you've got algae scrapers or off-walk feeders and stuff. You've got some species that evolve very, very specialized habits, the Chadiobranchus that are known as filter feeders, and they filter zooplankton and stuff out of the water. Uh, in Central America, you've got fish like what I call the water cows. That's all the big vieja species and stuff. Big, large, muscly, fat fish that can handle a lot of aggression from other species. Uh, they can also have a fair bit of aggression amongst themselves as they divide, develop their own pecking order. But these are mostly herbivorous species that eat the leaves and plant life and stuff that's around in their habitats. You go back over to Africa and you think about some of the West African species. Now most of you won't, won't remember, but back in the very early 80s when the, the first uh, buffalo heads were coming out in the scene, the steatocranus types, they were extremely, extremely aggressive and very challenging to keep alive when they were first brought over. But now you look at them today and you can find them in any pet store and you could probably breed them in your fish room in a 10 or a 20 gallon tank with a sponge filter. You would not have been able to do that back in the day. Now I remember that the first time, it was probably about 84, 85, that I, that I received uh, the first shipment that I got in of Steatocranus casuarius, the buffalo head. And the only, re the only way I was really successful was by, by my brain working in the way I am. I'm always looking at habitats. I'm trying to understand habitats. My research materials know no bounds. I go from behavioral books, scientific books, to description books, you know, things that go on the different topics and stuff. This is the type of stuff that keeps me up at night all the time, and I'm always researching. And I remember with those buffalo heads, I, it was long before the internet, so I was sending letters all over the place. I was trying to get information on the habitats and trying to truly figure it out. And when you find out what these things actually live in, you think it's almost impossible that they could survive in an aquarium with just normal aquarium filtration. So I took a 55, old school 55, which was a 36 by 18 by 18 inch footprint, and 
uh, back then the big thing, the big filters that most of the stores were using at the time were actually under gravel filters. And they work very, very well if you understand them and how they work. And I put an under gravel filter and then I put a, pig, a piece of lighting grid or egg crate on top of it to prevent them from digging. And I probably put about four inches of gravel and substrate. I put some inverted uh, clay flower pots with the bottoms holes made a little bit bigger and a bunch of boulders, granite boulders or species, uh, rocks that are native to me here. They're all over the place and they're, they, they, don't, they don't release anything into the water. They don't change the chemistry of the water whatsoever. And then instead of driving the under gravel filter using air, I put four of the power heads on it. And they were the, I think they were Hagen and they were the number 800 model. And these were intended for like hundreds of gallons and stuff. And I put four of them on that tank. This tank was class five rapids. The whole tank was just boiling the whole time. And I put these things in here and I, and I watched them. I put them in there. They got thrown around first bit, but by the next morning, these were the happiest buffalo heads I'd ever seen. And once they established and they found a way to live, they adapted really, really well. And what really, really drove it home is I just did that to recreate the habitat back then. I never really put a lot more thought into it other than I was trying to mimic the habitats to get to reproduce species because, as I say, that's the way my brain works. I want to do it as close as I can to nature with the tools I have to get them to reproduce, and then I generally move on. And over the years, my fish room evolved and changed and changed and changed. And uh, I was at a, a convention. It was actually a, a Canadian convention. And there was a speaker there, a world-renowned speaker known as Mr. Oliver Lucanus. Oliver Lucanus runs that uh, company known as Below Water. He has an absolutely breathtaking, stunning book called Amazon Below Water. Uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. I strongly recommend you pick up a copy. We'll show you a picture here. Uh, but... Uh, Oliver did a presentation, and it was, uh, it was in partnership with a company he works with. He's Canadian, he lives in Montreal, but he works with a company in Germany called Panta Ray. And uh, Panta Ray had to develop this uh, new water pump. It was basically a powerhead or a water pump, and it was in sterile. Instead of the normal standard flow, it was called laminar flow. And uh, it was a very unique style of pump. Uh, the only problem being is this pump was also somewhat fairly cost prohibitive to the average hobbyists. Now, public aquariums are buying these because this thing moved massive amounts of water with very, very low electrical output. And they're excellent, excellent pumps, but the average aquarium just couldn't afford them. But he did a presentation that was kind of coincided with launching this pump. And it was all underwater footage in high definition of showing how these fish lived in the wild. And I'm not talking buffalo heads, I'm just talking fish in general. And 90, I bet you almost all of the video he showed was all South American fish. And the thing that really, really caught me is it was like a light bulb went off in my head and it made me remember that back in the day, that buffalo head tank and how now most of my fish room was running on sponge filters. And we talk about aggression and channeling, uh, channel, uh, challenges that we faced in keeping some of these fish in the level of aggression that they have. And he showed us video of discus. Yes, wild discus in nature living in water behind rocks that was literally probably class four or class five rapids. And that is not a species. Most people associate discus in still water, you know, and I'm not saying discus want massive current. He was just basically expressing that there is a lot more current in nature than we are, than we're using within our tanks, particularly species that are riverine. Lake species, lake dwelling fish, we have different challenges when we come to aggression. But when it comes to riverine species, if you put current in their tank, it'll often solve a lot of your problems. You get some extremely hyper-aggressive species, a couple that come to mind, Tiliagramma brachardi, the little worm goby-like cichlids with the greatly reduced swim bladders from West Africa, or going over into, into Madagascar, the brilliant, stunning species, the bright, bright orange lamina, uh, Neurosatai, uh, that species there, these things are just so hyper aggressive with each other, they're constantly battling each other. Well, if anyone would take the time and look into really examining their habitats, these things live in such extreme fast water. And that's a critical factor in understanding and how we can develop me methods and means of controlling their aggression within a tank. Think about it. This little species is cichlid with a reduced swim bladder. He doesn't have the swim bladder and he's evolved to reduce the swim bladder so he can, he can capitalize and live in that environment that most other species can't. Think about it, if there's less species in that environment, that means there's more opportunity for food sources, whatever it may be that that species has evolved to, to feed off. So by, by capitalizing, evolving and changing your structures of your body to be able to adapt to live in these environments, you have a better chance of survival than somebody else that's gonna be competing with hundreds of hundreds of other species.
So that's an important factor of evolution. So by putting a giant pump, this species lives in a wild that the water is so fast that it, the minute it comes up, it's pushed back in the water fast and it might not be able to get back there. It's got to fight against the current because the current generally always goes one way. Okay, so to get to, to fighting that aggression, if we put a massive pump in the tank, when every time that fish comes up, it gets pushed around, that's more like na nature. But in the aquarium, if we take that pump away, that fish comes up and sees another one of its, another fish, that's competition. That's competition for the food, that's competition for its mates, that's competition for everything. All of a sudden that species becomes absolute hell on wheels and we're not ready for it and we don't understand how to control the aggression, throw a pump on it. So if you're dealing with anything that lives in a riverine system, doesn't matter where it is, we want to talk Central America, you think Irregularis, Macrothalamus, Wesleyi, any of those bullet-shaped fish that are extremely, extremely fast. Even some of the fast water fish from the Congo, South America, anything like that that's got that torpedo kind of shape, if it's got a reduced swim bladder, add a pump to the tank. Uh, and, and the higher the volume pump than you would ever consider. Uh, in my old 750 gallon tank, I remember when the company called Hydor came out with a water fan, it was a number eight. And the thing was about the size of a Canadian football or an American football. It was about this big. It was huge. But the reason I bought that one, and <laughs> I didn't buy that one because of the size of the pump. I bought that one because the, it was the only one that had a magnet that was strong enough to hold between three quarter inches of glass. And my tanks were made out of wood, which conveniently the side, that one side of the tank, was three quarter inches. So I thought, well, if I get, if it will go through glass, it'll go through wood. And it did, and it worked really, really well. But I remember the day that I put that on that tank. It was a fully established community tank of Central and South American cichlids. It had all the, the stingrays in it. It had the big giant bacorti in it. And they were all of like 16, 16, 18 inches in size. Uh, and the Lamina were in there at the time from Madagascar. It was a bunch, of, it was a hodgepodge collection of stuff, but it was a lot of aggression that needed a bit more controlling. And I put that thing in there and to, to watch with it, when I plugged it in, to watch a 16 or 18 inch species of fish swim by and literally get thrown like, like a child's toy across the tank for eight feet was a little bit scary. But uh, again, within a couple of days, they were up swimming as if that thing did not exist. And it was really, really impressive to see. So it's always stayed in the back of my mind when I think about it, is things of methods of controlling aggression. That's just one more tool in our arsenal. When we're setting up our tanks, we want to take into consideration not just, uh, not just their feeding, things that we talked about, but also the overall size of the species. If a species like, say, Dovi, and it gets to be a meter in length, I don't care what size tank you have. It's going to be a real struggle to control aggression in that. And that's not necessarily that you're doing anything wrong. It's just that Dovi, Umbraferis, some of these massive cruise predators, you, you could literally epoxy your entire basement and set up a massive community of fish in there. And eventually that species will strive for outright dominance in its environment and will probably beat on everything till it dies with the exception of some of the armored catfish, it'll kill almost all the other species in that environment because that's what it would do in nature. It would control its territory. And in nature, it can push other ones out and they will go away. They'll swim into its territory accidentally and get beat on and then swim away. In your aquarium, they can't do that. So it doesn't matter if you've got a swimming pool, your entire basement, a 600 gallon tank, 200 gallon tank, 1000 gallon, it doesn't matter. Big, massive, heavy bruiser cruise predators like those will always come out on top and you're never gonna have success with them long, long term. Now, the well-known breeders, Mr. Jeff Raps at Tangled Up in Cichlids, uh, a lot of people back in the day, uh, Jim Cummings, a lot of those guys back in the day, when they kept a lot of those bigger fish, your red devils and all those real aggressive Central American cichlids, and some of them are South American as well, same counterparts, they would keep them in what's called a divided tank method. And that's a nice big tank, as big as you could get. I put the male on one side and the female on the other side, and a, a divider in the middle with small little holes in the divider that the female can get through if she has amorous intentions with the male, but the male can't get through and the female as a way of retreating should she decide that she doesn't want to have Minga Minga. And that works really, really well for some species. The only problem being is we tend to get lace, lazy and we tend to get complacent and more often than not the divider gets knocked down and one kills the other or something happens. It's also not a very aesthetically pleasing tank so they don't appeal to me at all. Maybe they appeal to you and if you're a breeder and you want maximum yields maybe this is the best method for you. 
good for you. That's great. I'm not condoning and I'm not saying it's good or bad. It's working. Keep going with it. Now in my ramblings, we've kind of gone over all over the gambit. We've talked about behavioral and stuff. We've talked some of them about environmental. Environmental could be other things. Uh, maybe you have a mix of species and you're, you're keeping them maybe a little bit warmer than they all need to be. If you heat them up, aggression level comes up. Just thinking all the crazy people down there in Florida. You know, it gets hot, hot, hot in the summertime there. All the crazy stuff happens down there. All you see all the weird stuff all over the internet. What's happening in Florida? What's happening in Florida today? All the crazy stuff. That's because it's too damn hot. Cool it down a little bit. 76 for Malawi is probably just perfect. It keeps control of the aggression level, and Malawi can actually handle a lot cooler. Tanganyika is a little bit more, uh, more closer to the equator. It needs it a little bit warmer, I agree. Uh, and, you know, South America, there's different zones, different regions, you know. But, you know, t take a look at what their actual ideal is, and maybe if you just cool them down a little bit, it might just solve all your problems. Boundaries, look at boundaries within the tank. Visual boundaries, not to you, to the fish. Clay flower pots have always been used, PVC pipes, those type of things. Any of those things, they provide a visual barrier to the fish. Creating, think of taking the, the tank. If you want to have, you got a 100-gallon tank and you want to keep this species of Central American and this species of Central American, you want two pairs to inhabit peacefully in that tank? Okay, well, we can probably do that if you create zones or rooms within that aquarium and different visual barriers that they can they, they can kind of get around each other. They can hide. They can still know where everybody is. They have their own spatial distance. That's a good another tool. Another thing that I've always used, silver dollars. I absolutely love silver dollars. Back in the day when my massive fish room was running, I would have always on hand three, four dozen of different species of silver dollars, which is why I was able to breed them all. It's because I always had them on hand. And the real reason I had them on hand wasn't because I'm absolutely infatuated with silver dollars. It's really because they made amazing dither fish. And dither fish, or target fish, are species that just swim around fast in the environment, and uh, they're bigger, they're chunkier, they can often handle, depending on the size of the species and the, the aggression level of said species, they can handle a little bit of chase they can handle a little bit of odd little pecks and pushes around and stuff like that. And what that does is that diffuses the level of aggression of the male versus the female and vice versa. If the male is always kept busy, same as in the human race, maybe we're not going to harass the females as much anymore. You know, because if the female decides that say, hey, I'd like to have some babies with you. Hey, we're all on board for that, right? We're all good. I'm good. Let's make the babies. I'm having fun, right? We're doing the babies. But man, the eggs are there and the babies are there, and, and mom's taking care of them. Dad's got to help defend and stuff like that. But eventually, dad starts to think, hey, you know what? I'd kind of like to have some more babies, you know? And uh, mom's sitting there, no, we've got all these babies. We're going to take care of them forever. We're going to love them forever. And that's when the aggression level often amps up, specifically in a lot of the Central American stuff, some of the different South American species as well. You often see that where the male all of a sudden gets really, really aggressive. And it's not always that the, the big, giant, dominant male kills the female. It's quite often the reverse, that the female will kill the male. I've seen a four-inch dovi kill a, a, a two-foot-long dovi. It seems completely unimaginable, but it happens, you know. Go get yourself a short girlfriend. See how well it works out for you. You know, they're, they're aggressive, waspy little creatures. So when species are breeding, often aggression level really, really amps up. And that's true, because that's their role. They're, they're, they're protectors, right? We have to protect our offspring and our right to be able to produce offspring. So uh, they're going to protect it against all costs. And there's very, very few cichlids that go to such extremes as that big giant Lake Tanganyika species, the, the Boulanger acromus microlepsis. It's a huge predator, but they get about a meter in size. There's some great videos online. Uh, I believe National Geographic had an amazing one where it was defending against a turtle. And this, the problem with this fish is an adult pair of Boulanger acromus will take care of their offspring for up to three months, maybe even longer. And the problem that happens is the parents eventually waste away. And once the offspring are of size that they can go off on their own, the parents often die. So that, you know, that's, that's parenting at a next level. That's really, really cool. Now that's on the extreme side of things. Now look at it from the other perspective. How many of out, out, you, you guys out there have ever kept an epistogramma species before and seen the aggression level of a female epistogramma? That's crazy level aggression. You know, like these things, when, they, when they're breeding, they are vicious defenders of their progeny. So that's really, really cool. The little Costa Rican and Nicaraguan species, species uh, Nitropolis nematopus, 
uh, often called the poor man's trophius. As such a, it's such a cool species, but it's often maligned in the hobby because it's just so, so aggressive. It's a little fish, but that little fish lives sympatrically in the wild with things like dovi and everything like that. And to, to maintain its place, it's got to be the bully. It has to be. It's, it's, the kid that, it's the kid that gets arrested and goes to jail and looks for the biggest guy in the yard and wants to deck him out so he shows his dominance. If, if, if the Natropolis didn't do that, it would get killed and eaten. That's just the way it is. It's life in the aquarium. Another good friend of mine, uh, Jonathan Straczynski uh, from Ohio, of the Ohio Cichlid Association. Everyone thinks he's my brother. We're kind of brothers. We're still family. But Jonathan does a, a really, really good talk as well uh, about managing aggression in Central American cichlids, which has been his primary interest for many, many, many years. And he goes through all those exact same points. He understands. Like, Jonathan has a fish room where he has everything from five-gallon tanks all the way up to 1,200-gallon tanks and many, many sizes in between. So he can deal with almost anything that comes along. He gets a fish that's super, super hyper-aggressive. It doesn't necessarily mean it needs a bigger tank. Maybe it needs different tank mates. Maybe it needs visual barriers. Maybe it needs a temperature influence. Maybe it needs water movement. Any of those things that we've talked about, but he's able to deal with that. I'm not saying you need to have a 1,200 gallon tank or whatever in your fish room. You guys keep what you keep and have what you have and be happy with it. But start questioning, start looking at things, start looking at things from a different angle. Start trying to figure out why this fish works this way. You know, like I said to you, if it has a reduced swim bladder and you know it comes from a river and it's really, really aggressive, throw a water pump in there and see if it changes it for you. I bet you it will, you know. As always, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope this is just going to be more of a, a discussion instead of Biggs just chatting. I want to, this is out of all the ones I've sent before, all my other postings, I'd like to have a lot of discussion going on this one. Let's keep it going. And maybe there's a certain facets within this talk or this discussion that you guys want me to develop on a little bit further. You know me already. I like to ramble, and that's never going to change. But if there's something that we want to address a little bit more, a bit more in depth, Biggs is always up for it. As always, thanks, guys. Take care.